Now, next, I want to introduce the judging panel, starting with Professor Ruth Hayhoe from Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, right here in University of Toronto. Uh, Professor Wang from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Kelly Schultz, Senior Development Officer from University of Waterloo. Colin Ryrie, Relationship Manager from Brock University. And George Vandeker, Principal of Toronto Central Academy. Okay, now we're getting ready to go here. I'll briefly explain the judging criteria. We have four things we're gonna look at, the judges are gonna look at, originality, communication, accuracy, and presentation of speaking. Now, the judges will be asking each contestant uh, a series of a couple questions. There will be a time limit of three to four minutes. So um, youth contestants, please stick to that time limit. Okay, there is, a, there is a strict time limit. We need to get through that today. Okay, so I'll introduce the first panelist. Uh, finalist number one, Amy Zado. Finalist number two, Barbara Rodriguez. Finalist number three, Chelsea Muha Muwati, and finalist number four, Iman Ali Saeed. So basically what's gonna happen is there will be a group of four in each group, okay? And so there's four different groups, okay? And two professors will be uh, asking questions to each finalist, okay? Starting with the first one will be Professor Heho and Professor Wong, and then, the second finalist will be George and Kelly will be asking questions to Barbara Rodriguez. The third panelist, Chelsea Muwati, uh, Colin and Professor Heho will ask a question. And the fourth one, Iman Ali Saeed, Professor Wang and George will be asking questions. Now, if I mispronounce your name for any reason, I'm sorry for that, okay? Okay, let's get started now. Hi, Amy, finalist number one, you may get started with your presentation. Would you please uh, remember the time limit? Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Imagine a peaceful world. I bet it looks different to all of you. Maybe some of you feel the sun beaming down on you or hear the waves crashing into the shore. Some of you probably see a community bonding, freedom of expression or equality. For me, I see all people living in harmony, accepting their differences and understanding that that is what defines us as being human, creating relationships founded on trust and using our different experiences to unite and strengthen us. Unfortunately, as the world continues to expand and develop, the global peace follows a downward trend. The global peace index of countries um, for the past nine years has been decreasing. I think as youth, we can bring our unique perspectives together to try to reverse this. Even just looking around now and watching my competitor submissions, we all have different ideas and different mediums, yet our outlooks are similar. Just starting these discussions can spark so much change and I, I'm grateful to be a part of it. So I wanted to thank all the organizers, the judges and the participants for all the time they've put in. My name is Amy Zato. I'm a 16 year old student from Mississauga and I joined this challenge to use the knowledge I have for good. I feel like I've already grown through discussions I've had and through research I've done, and I've learned about what a lot of businesses have already done to create a more united world. Businesses connect creators with consumers, and they have this unique ability to cross nations, cultures, and disciplines. And their actions and messages leave long-lasting impacts on society, so they have the power to create a more peaceful world especially if they find a more balanced approach between being good global citizens and financial gain. In short, I think if businesses and strong business leaders change their thoughts from how will I benefit to how can we benefit, they will see that they have the power to emphasize injustices in society and rally public support to change it. If you think about it, change always starts with internal reflection. And since businesses are made up of individuals, that's where it needs to start. Trying to move past biases and judgment, even if it's just one person, can be the spark that starts the flame. 
Internally, I believe implementing further staff training on interpersonal skills while hiring diverse staff will foster an inclusive and supportive environment within the company and this will then be projected outwards. It's really important for employees to understand that better relationships will impact them positively, but it'll also help others and their environment. Externally, I believe it's necessary for marketing and sales personnel being the front line of the company to use empathy, acceptance, and transparency in all that they do, um, and this will strengthen relationships. And businesses should also be expanding their markets um, so that they can provide their service or product where it is more valued and needed. And by showing this commitment to help the local economy instead of just getting profit, they become more globally connected and respected by being more socially responsible. Conflict will never cease to exist. It can't just disappear. But if everyone acknowledges that it doesn't resolve anything, then we can work together towards a brighter future. Businesses are just a group of individuals with one common vision. Individuals like you. Is that vision really just getting a profit? Or is it to create a more peaceful world for your community and the future generations? From now on, I want you to wake up believing that you can be better, whether it's personally or professionally. I want you to know that you can make a difference and inspire others to do the same. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Amy. May I now ask Professor Blue Tehol to ask her question, okay? Thank you, Amy. That was a very inspiring presentation. I enjoyed reading your text also. I just wanted to ask, you gave the example of Bill Gates and Microsoft, which I think many of us know. Do you have any other examples of companies that you feel are really exemplary in terms of the kind of qualities that you've spoken about? Yeah, so definitely, Microsoft is definitely one of the bigger ones. Um, but I've also, I was talking to my mom, she works at Sun Life, and she said that Sun Life has done a lot of uh, mental health stuff and a lot of stuff to sort of make their employees feel better and have a more supportive environment. And they are also a very big global company. Um, and they've been like rebranding to show how they are for the community. So stuff like that, I think is really important. Another big story is Tom's, how when you buy a pair of their shoes, they donate one to countries in need. They've donated thousands of pairs of shoes. And I think that's really incredible that they're trying to help and they're showing that they are involved and worried about the state of the world and they're trying to make it better. Thank you, those are great examples. I think someone else now is going to ask you another question. Yes, if I may add, Professor, I want to give you the second question. Okay, Amy, you're doing great. Hi, Amy, that's a very well presented um, talk and then also I enjoy reading your um, essay there. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you could help us to, um, well, to intel, what, what is this um, customer experience maturity if you, don't mind to explain that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a lot of businesses, especially in capitalistic environments are very profit oriented. So they're looking at, oh, how can I um, build stuff off site and then ship it in to reduce my costs? But a lot of the time that's not necessarily ethical. Um, and also they tend to focus more on this profit than they do on the customer. And the only way that businesses really get money is by having customers, by having consumers. And so they, it's really important for them to cater to their customers and give their customers the experience that will make them want to come back and make them feel valued and needed. Um, and that's really important just to create good relationships and supportive environments in general, but it also profits the company. So I think it just needs to be more focused on. And there's a lot of stats that show how being more customer oriented and service oriented improves um, profits and he like retains customers for longer. So I think that will not only help the world, but businesses. So that should be more implemented. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you, Professor Wang. And thank you, Professor Heiho for your questions. And thank you, Amy. You, you did a wonderful job. If I may ask finalist number two, Barbara, to start her presentation, okay? Thank you. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Barbara Rodriguez. I am a 17-year-old Mexican student, and I will be glad to tell you about how peace and education should coexist together. Well, quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. But 
what if weapons are the ones that are taking education away from us? Let's say, we take our classes and then we do our homework and then we will repeat that same actions the next day and the next one and the next one and so on. But there are millions of children that do not have that exact same routine with us. And we take it for granted now. When a human right, which in this case for my topic is education, is being taken away because of conflicts, because of shootings, because of another threatening events, that's our red flag and our call to action. We must act. I mentioned at the beginning millions of children. In reality, they are 27 million kids attending school because of their countries being in conflict. We, the people who are around my age, are the ones who are closer to the future. But the kids are future generation. And we are avoiding the fact that in the world, there are 2,200 millions of kids. And two out of five of them haven't even finished this. Why should global peace and education should stick together, you may ask. And although it seems like a pretty easy question, it goes further than that and then become a little bit complex. Peace cannot stop wars by itself. It's us. It needs our help because we are the ones that create peace. When by smallest actions, and I'm gonna give you an example of that. Being respectful towards our teachers, our classmates, our friends, and our neighbors even. The space we can do, and we are providing peace to the community and to ourselves. With all being said, I want you, the people who are watching this right now, or tomorrow, or even in a year, to create awareness that we're through right now. We were given the privilege of education, and we should start providing it to the younger ones. We want them to be in contests like this one. We want them to have a brighter future. And I'm, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Barbara. A little bit of technical difficulty okay. won't deter your wonderful, uh, um, wonderful point of view. And now I would like to ask Mr. George Vanderker to ask you your first question, okay? Hi, Barbara. It's, you did break up a little bit and that's too bad, but it will not affect anything. I, I'm gonna ask you a, a really hard question. Um, can you give me an example of, uh, of a time when education uh, contributed to world peace? I'm sorry, can you repeat the yes. question? It got cut off. That's okay. Uh, give it an example of what, how education or what, at a time when education did contribute to uh, world peace. Okay, so you ask how education contributes to world peace, right? A specific example. It's a hard question. You know, you can kind of make make the answer what you want it to be. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I'm gonna be speaking in general terms. I. Mm -hmm. What I understand about your question is that when we get to know, like, our, when we start to. Uh, reflect about what happened in the past, like all the wars, all the conflicts, armed conflicts that have happened, we start changing our mind, we start changing our perspective of the world. And that is because we get an education, because we start to learn by ourselves or in school. And then we decide to make a change. And I think that's what all of us, all of you, and all of you also, yeah. in your 
That's that's a very good answer, actually. Uh, after the first world, after the second world war, uh, Europe had to be rebuilt, and you cannot change old people like myself, but you can change youth, and so there was a lot of emphasis in education on changing attitudes of youth towards all of the things that you have talked about. Thank you. Thank you, George, for your question. And thank you, Barbara, for doing a wonderful job answering George's question. Now, may I ask Ms. Kelly from Waterloo to ask you your second question, OK? Hi, Barbara. Thank you very much for your essay. It, uh, it was a very good read, so thank you for that. Um, in your essay, you had mentioned about implementing um, programs in schools that support um, and fund the uprooted children's education. Can you talk a little bit of what you think those programs might look like? Yes. Uh, what I think or what I have in mind about those programs in starting by our own communities, not our country because it's a really big um, space, but our own city, our own town, we can go to the government and speak to them how we should start um, don't, don't have the same opportunities. Uh, it may be like economic resources or problems to travel from one place to another, et cetera, to help them provide some materials, some scholar materials, like personalized classes and stuff. And when we start doing that, um, that's when the change is gonna be seen because that's the way we're helping, like in a little amount, but we're starting the change. I want to implement with our town government to be specific, because that's how we can spend and spend until we get to a country. And then when the country is all with the same program, or maybe with different variants of those programs, uh, we can start doing our, our countries and then we will have a big impact in the whole world. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Bravo. You did a wonderful job. Now we can um, go to our third finalist, Chelsea. Go ahead with your presentation, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea. I'm a 16-year-old student who lives in Toronto. I decided to participate in the Global Youth Challenge in order to share my ideas on global peace and also in order to try something new. Have you ever wondered why racial inequality still exists? Well, my answer to this is racial, equality, racial inequality still exists because of the lack of love amongst humans caused by personal prejudice or the lack of education on racial topics. I believe that in order for us to obtain world peace, we need to unite the different races of the world in order to empower them and in order to learn from our experiences and, perspect and different perspectives. One of my two main, um, two of my main points in achieving this are reducing violence. An example of violence can be police brutality. And another example that is presently happening right now is the discrimination that the Asian community is facing because of the coronavirus. Um, this, this violence towards them is meant is affecting them mentally and physically there are a lot of children that are being attacked and elderly people that are also being attacked i feel as though that i feel i feel as though the police need to do more to arrest the people that are doing these kind of acts my second point is promoting equal rights we can promote equal rights in the workforce in the medical field and also in the government as racism is a systematic thing and has been ingrained in our society so deeply. We can also help black people find more jobs and also help other races that are also facing racism in America or in Canada and all over the world. You may be also wondering how you can contribute. Well, you can contribute by educating yourself on racial topics, learning more and putting yourself in another person's perspective in order to understand how racism affects them and how you can do better as a person. You can also stand up for what is right. When you see racism or when you see even bullying in schools, you can stand up and stop the person bullying the other person and try and help them understand why this is not right or why this um, affects the other person negatively. 
I also think that during the Black Lives uh, movements, there was there was a lot of improvement in how we promote love and also in how we educate other people. Right now, social media is one of the biggest platforms that we can help people learn more about racial topics. And I believe that we can try and do better. Um, and I also wanted to say that as a person, you should understand that um, you should be able to understand another person's perspective and feel sympathy for them. And so this is why racism is a very um, bad thing. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Chelsea, you did great. And then now may I ask Mr. Colling from Brock to ask you your first question, okay? Yeah, great, great job, Chelsea. Um, a really important topic and you're very articulate. So thank you so much. Um, so in, in your submission, you talked about the importance of, you know, sort of the broad, the broad view of loving each other and, and how that's, you know, we, we need to love each other to, to promote peace. So what do you, what are the biggest barriers to, to loving each other? Um, I think one of the biggest barriers is obviously discrimination. Some people are brainwashed to think that other races are minority. And I think the division is what is causing um, love not to be promoted um, equally and efficiently. Um, I also feel as though um, sometimes we feel as though we're superior than other people. And so we view them as less than human. And this really affects the way we interact with each other. Um, yeah, that is my answer. Great, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Now, your second question will come from Professor Hayho from University of Toronto. Professor, go ahead, please. Thank you. Chelsea, what a great presentation. I think each of your three points was very significant and you responded well. I want to ask you about your painting. I really loved it. I thought it was great. And I had two connected questions. You have Africa in the center of it. And then you have all the arms reaching out, right? With different colors, different races, but they look a bit like fists. And that kind of puzzled me a little bit why they look like fists. So that's my double barrel question on your painting, which was really quite dramatic, I have to say. Thank you for the question. Well, I decided to uh, paint fists because they really show strength and empowerment. And I also decided to put them all around the globe because it, that shows unity. Then I decided to paint Africa in the middle because this just um, the way I view the world most of the time. Like most of the time when I see uh, the globe, I all see like Africa in the middle. But um, I also feel as though the other continents are also um, uh, have the same importance and equality. Um, yes, and that is also where I'm from. So. Thank, Thank you. you. I thought that was great. Very powerful having Africa in the center. <laughs> Thank you for explaining. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for your question. And thank you, Chelsea, for your wonderful answer. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead to find us number four, Iman. If you're ready to start, you can go ahead with your presentation, okay? Good morning, everybody. I'm Iman al Said. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. I'm currently studying in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, before I start, I want to thank the judges for giving such a great effort in this competition. And I want to thank the JYC community for giving me a chance to share my honest opinions and for spreading this concept for youth is all around the world and providing them with such a great opportunity to express their ideas and beliefs. Let me start by asking everybody a question. Who do you think is the most powerful human between us? It might be a baffling question, but you may elicit what I mean during my presentation. In my essay, I formed a happiness equation, which is morals leads to knowledge, knowledge leads to happiness, and lastly, happiness leads to peace. This equation depends on first changing an individual, then the community, and will eventually change the world. So in my essay, I summarized my vision into four main points. Successful peace occurs, ethics or virtuous principles, education, and how social media presents news mostly. I believe that achieving global peace is not a wish, but a reality. It could be present reality we live in. And the evidence is the existence of peace agreements that have already occurred back in time. I found many conferences and treaties that help many countries to live peacefully without power or wars. All that they have used was negotiating and sincere desire for peace. I mentioned Egyptian President Anwar al-Sadat as one of those people that were earnest in fighting for peace. Evidently, many acts have happened like the one of Tajikistan, Ireland, and South Africa. 
all aimed for peace and security. While reading about every accord, I, did deci I decided to watch some videos of those great people too. The way they spoke and how they address other people fascinated and motivated me. And I thought, what about if we applied those approaches in our daily life? This is when I came up with my vision. First and foremost, to achieve global peace, we must prepare a generation that has ethics of tolerance, forgiveness, and humility, and apply these morals in our practical life. Because if we just taught our youth these principles and we did not put them into action, then, then there's no need to teach them at the first place. At these ends, we will have a generation capable of negotiating and addressing people with different mental capacities, inclination, and intellectual orientation. But this generation is liable to give up on these principles when they meet other people or members of the community. This is when education comes into action. Educational environment helps this, this generation to consolidate these values by changing the concept of strength. The point is self-control when, when anger is power. Humility is power, forgiving is power. Thus, this will make our generation adhere to morals such as tolerance, love, forgiveness, and humility, even when they're facing any kind of obstacles. Additionally, media is a double-edged weapon. We must use media to spread, to spread peace and to show youths like me and my fellow peers here that peace is real and we can make it happen. This is not a dream to achieve global peace. Yes, we might encounter some obstacles, most importantly time, but how many wars last decades? And as Pierre Trudeau once said, give peace a chance has been a sensible advice. Thank you so much for listening to me. I hope you liked my presentation and thank you once again for giving me a chance. Thank you very much, Iman, that was wonderful. And may I ask Professor Wang to present you your first question, okay, Professor? Thank you, Iman, that was wonderful. Um, I like your, your um, statement talking about moral lead to knowledge and knowledge lead to happiness and subsequently to happiness and then to peace. Could you just um, explain a little bit more what you consider as the most suitable knowledge, you know, as to serve that role as a bridging between, you know, um, from um, so-called um, moral to um, happiness? Yes, so education is very important in, in like helping morals to stick into the human. Like if you raise our children to get to get to be well educated and well well spoken and know how to speak and how to negotiate with other people, this is a kind of education. You know what I mean? Like education is has many branches, but what I meant in my in my essay that this kind of knowledge is the knowledge of how you speak and how you can negotiate with other people. Thank you. I think it's the education empower the knowledge or the, to deliver knowledge, right? So is that what you're saying? Okay, thanks. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor, for your question. And thank you, Iman, for your wonderful answer. Now your second question will come from uh, George Vanderker. Um, Mr. Vanderker, go ahead, please. There, I've unmuted. Iman, that was great. And um, I really agree with, uh, with your idea about leadership. So could you give me, what would be the one quality of a leader that would make world peace more likely? Okay, so one quality of leadership is mostly of being brave because any kind of treaties that happened, mostly they concentrated on people that started the Peace Act. The one who started the Peace Act has much bravery, like, and I think that bravery is somehow connected to, to leadership because they know how to lead people more and knowing how to make uh, greater, greater ethos and kids all around the world. I think so. And also, of course, I think a leader with good morals would also be helpful. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Iman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Vandeker, for your question. And thank you, Iman, for your wonderful presentation and for sharing all your thoughts. Now I'd like to invite Daryl, our um, MC, to share um, thank you and, uh, what, and the list of country champions. Okay, Daryl, go ahead, please. Okay. Before I do the list of country champions, I want to talk about briefly the supporters. University of Waterloo 
in Kitchener, Brock University, Queen's University, University of Toronto, and TEA. And secondly, I want to talk about just quickly, the MP Ellie Assassi, MP for Willowdale, MPP Logan Kanapathy for Markham Thornhill and MPP Vincent Key for Donhill Valley North. Thank you for your letter of support. Now, well, I'll quickly go through the country champion certificates from around the world. First, Ifoma Dandy Sun from Nigeria. Secondly, Hu Bao Chao from Vietnam. No, sorry. Luca Yuser Lee from Canada. Hu Bao Chao from Vietnam. Number three, Barbara Rodriguez from Mexico, who you just heard of. Sophie Hempel from France. Iman Ali Saeed from Egypt. Next, Eleonora Burai from Italy. Almida Bruna from Brazil. Zuhor Chamamim from Tunisia. And lastly, Kai Yu from China. Thank you, global finalists, country finalists. Thank you, Daryl. Would you like to introduce the second group of uh, finalists, please? Okay. I just want to thank all the first panelists and the judges. Second group of finalists, Helena Zhu and Leslie Negun. Thirdly, Jasmine Hugh and Leslie Berra. And Helen Zhu, um, Kelly and Colin will be asking her questions. Okay, thank you very much panelists and contestants. All right, Helena, you may begin. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Helena Xu and I am one of the finalists for this year's GYC. Before I begin, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the panel of judges for their time, the GYC for organizing this wonderful opportunity, as well as congratulate each of the 16 finalists for their achievements. Now on to my topic for the GYC. Today I'll be introducing my lens of working towards achieving world peace, which is through the use of literature and language. As a little warm up, I have a question for the audience and judges, something for you to think about, to reflect on. I want you to recall your favorite novel or piece of text. I'm sure something has popped into mind for all of us. Now, thinking of this text, what do you feel? Why is it that you strongly like it? Was it controversial in any way? Have you had perhaps a discussion with your friend or family member on how you might have interpreted it differently? Well, all these questions that I have addressed are essentially a representation of the impact that literature and language can have on your own development and point, on view, point of view of various topics. You see, no matter the type of text, whether it be a nonfiction novel or an autobiography, the power of language and literature is that you are able to understand and discover a whole new outlook or mindset on a concept that would otherwise be foreign land for you. When there are words on paper or even text on a screen, you are able to eliminate all personal judgment and biases, which then enables you to read and appreciate the text for what it is, that being the true takeaway that the writer wants to bring to light to you. As you can see, my interpretation of world peace is that the current barrier we face is instead of embracing our differences and supporting each other as one community, we let individualistic views fog our true goal. Ultimately, I believe that either consciously or subconsciously, humanity's actions are directed towards world peace and integrating into change that is beneficial for all of us. We just need to be able to recognize the hardships that we face and to be able to break down different identities and backgrounds, which is why I believe language and literature is a perfect starting point. 
Through words, we are able to convey our emotions and to change each other's perception on the world. Additionally, it is oftentimes through works of literature that new and even controversial ideas are brought to the table and personal obstacles are expressed. Using these works, our empathy and compassion is invoked and society as a whole is then able to gain a better understanding of each other and to recognize our mistakes and how we can improve ourselves to aid those in need. With language and literature, we are also able to become more accepting citizens as while we read, we form connections and realize that we are not alone, as at the end of the day, we all work to cultivate a better life for ourselves and our loved ones. This is why I believe that literature and language is able to have a lasting effect on the person that we become, which then influences each individual's personality and point of view in order to work together and collaborate in the grand scheme, which of course is towards achieving world peace. Now, just before I finish up, I would like to leave you all with a parting thought. I challenge each and every one of you to read a piece of text. If you want something short, Start with poetry. If you're a theater buff, there's a great selection of plays out there. The point is, I want you to read and reflect on the content. Think about how the writer has communicated with you, what new topics or concerns have been introduced, and how this work has ultimately influenced you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena. That was wonderful. Now may I ask Ms. Kelly from Waterloo to ask you the first question, please. Thank you. Uh, that was a, a very well written essay and you're very articulate. So thank you very much. Um, I too agree that um, there is uh, humanities play an important role in, um, in, in world peace. So thank you. Um, I have a hypothetical question for you today. Um, so let's say you're working for the UN um, in the, their peacekeeping initiative and they came to you to ask how do they implement um, more literature and language um, into the hands and minds of youth across the world. How would you go about this? Well, to start off, um, it is always useful and it's beneficial for youth to read new texts as we're oftentimes kind of um, restricted to only the fantasies or fiction novels that we read on a daily basis and for our own enjoyment. And so I think that education and schools do have a part in, of course, um, kind of the reading groups that we have and the reading assignments that are introduced to us. But oftentimes students find that they just think of it as a homework assignment. They think of it as a task they must complete um, to get the best grades, something like that, right? And instead of changing that kind of mindset, instead of blocking off to only um, seeing as a point or a value system, we need to also open up to different types of literature, not only as a classics um, from our past and kind of the same Shakespeare we've read for already hundreds of years, we should introduce new works from current and modern writers as well. And not only kind of novels, but also introduce poetry and plays. That way we're able to introduce different perspectives as well as how um, different pieces of text invoke kind of different emotions and have different meanings to each individual. And so I think if the UN were to approach me with that kind of question, um, I would start off with reevaluating our, um, our literature and language kind of system at the moment. So how each country kind of brings about their homework tasks and what, uh, what novels or books or classics they're currently reading, perhaps implementing upgrades into that and um, advancements into different novels and more modern works. And then through that, we're then able to um, create and invoke more passionate discussions between each student and individual, which then fuels um, the thinking and the cultivation of new mindsets at the end. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Helena. So your second question will come from Colin from Brock. It's um, amazing, so articulate, uh, incredibly well-spoken. Um, so my, my question, you know, you talked about how it's important for, for students to be reading more and absor absorbing different literatures from different cultures. But if you, I'm guessing you have sort of maybe your top uh, art, or, or author or artist. So if you had one author or, or a poem, um, a poet, that you think would really be a great leader for promoting world peace, who, who would that be? 
Oh, that's a tough one. I have a lot of favorite works. Um, something that I would like to mention that has kind of um, influenced me and also was sort of an inspiration backbone to my essay um, was actually a playwright that I was introduced through school. Um, it's Henrik Ibsen, and he has written a few plays, um, Ghosts and a Doll's House, that I really enjoyed. Um, and so it's not, it's not only kind of the play and I really like the content, but also kind of the messages that he brings forward. And also, because um, personally, I, I've never read a play before. That was the first play I've written. And it was through that that I was able to be introduced into kind of um, historical mindsets and how the entire Norwegian society was kind of appalled. And there were, there were um, it was a controversial topic of how Nora, the, the female character was leaving her, her family and her home. And so I think it's through works like these that not necessarily, um, of course the readers enjoy it, but also it gets them thinking and it kind of inspires them. And they realize that they're not alone. There's people that are just like them. Um, they may be across the country, but they still have kind of the same goals and same motivations. And so I think um, if, I, if I had to be narrowed down something as um, I would recommend to others, I would recommend Henrik Ibsen, but also just kind, to, kind of um, open your own eyes and to be more accepting of different genres and different themes. Don't just block yourself off into only romance novels or only fantasy novels. Um, be more inclusive and just try new things. At least give it a try. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Colin, for your question. Thank you, Helena, for that wonderfully uh, articulate uh, information that you share and your presentation. Now, I may, may I ask number six, Leslie, to share her presentation. Go ahead, Leslie. Thank you. Okay. Good day to all the judges and the students who are attending at this room at the moment. I am Leslie Niem, a 16-year-old student in the Arendelle Academy, and it's my honor to be the top 16 in the Global Youth Challenge. As we recall to the theme of this year, GYC, world peace, let me ask you an introductory question. Do you think that you're living in a world peace today? World peace is about everyone feeling happiness, freedom, and peace in their daily lives. It might sound like a responsibility for world leaders only, but actually each and every one of us has the power and the potential to create world peace. At this moment, you may have your answer to my question and different beliefs. But please keep the question throughout my speech as we can make more sense the more you listen. Peace connects people, people create peace. One way or another, relationships are like the dominoes effect to the enormous world of peace. For my GYC topic, I will clarify how can people have better relationships with each other can lead to world peace. The main message of my video is that something more everyday life and imaginable where relationships between people are like the foundation to world peace. In my point of view, in order for people to have strong connections, they should keep two things, which I've also mentioned in my submissions. One, respect other despite differences, and two, developing communication skills. One, respecting, respect each other despite differences. Existing such a statement like, no one is perfect, we are built differently, so we ought to accept people's weaknesses. The process of normalization and the process of give and receive doesn't mean forcing yourself in one's belief. Just simply say everyone deserves it and why not? Everyone comes from a different background. So we ought to be open-minded to different beliefs, ideas and opinions. Let's say take example of love. It is undeniable and obviously that people deserve love whether it's friendship, romantic or family relationship. Whatever kind and connection it is, it should be fully respected by both people in the relationship and the people around the two. But make sure to tell the difference between normalization and stereotyping. Then we can hope to see a strong community. Another thing I want to demonstrate that I have mentioned above is developing communication skills. To give you an explanation why is it effective, keep to mind that communication occurs when somebody understands you, not just when you speak. One of the most warning thoughts in a conversation is that you assume that the other person has understood the message you try to get across, which is also known as poor communication, which can lead to misunderstanding. And I bet you don't want it. So what makes a good conversation? One, put yourself in someone's shoes when about to share your subjective aspect. You don't want to act offensive and manipulative. Another thing is to, to have a good communication skills 
you yourself should be a good listener. Do not impose yourself. Uh, do not impose them with your own idea if they don't ask for one. But if they do, please keep an open mind and relax among other. It gives all of them, and of course you too, the ease. All the things I've mentioned above simply illustrate my points about the topic. Let's go back to the question I asked at the beginning. Are you living in a peaceful world? In other words, in your daily life, do you have a harmonious relationship with respect and good communication? Is it such a pleasant surprise that small things like this are the essential elements to create world peace? After this presentation, I encourage you to develop a respectful attitude towards people who are different from you and listen with empathy when communicate with them. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Um, I have finished my presentation. So I guess uh, my turn to ask, am I the one to ask questions? So first. Uh, sure, you and Professor Ruth, whoever would like to go first, go ahead, please, sir. Okay. Yeah, thanks, uh, Leslie. That's very well presented. I find it's a very um, inspirational what you're saying there. Um, I'm just, um, I really appreciate what you're saying in terms of communication. So many of us need to be a very good listener. So I'm just thinking if you would share your brilliant thoughts on how would you convey your message more effectively while you're be a good listener. So you said a few more points. So I, I think I would like to hear a bit more on that. Say, so, um, what would you suggest? So the fact that I mentioned to be a good uh, to be to be in good communication, you need to be a good listener. And of course, you be a good listener doesn't mean you just sit there and hearing what other people is telling. You need to hear them with attention and relaxed, um, relaxed and open mind. Um, listeners. Listeners, there is like an essential and they're like a professional in listening. To listen, you have to pay attention to what they're saying, to pay attention to your, their micro expressions. By, by being an effective listener, you can also un, uh, arrange their relationship as well. Um, then you can understand what they're going through, understand what they're be a better listener, be a better friend, and get 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 to know them easier by paying attention and but like yeah, pay attention to your my their micro expressions can be a really good way. Okay. Thanks, Leslie. So I think it's my turn, uh, Leslie, to ask you a question. I want to say I enjoyed the little video you prepared. I thought it was very creative and that you could put the ideas together in that very different way with the, with the characters and figures in your video. And I, I was also really interested in, you know, communication, that piece. I think that's a key piece. And I want to ask you, in addition to listening, which is not easy to learn, I don't think we teach it very well in Canada. I'll be love to hear that. But is there also an element of observing that we need to see people's faces, movements, and so on as a part of communication? And that's become quite difficult with COVID now when many people have to wear masks and so on. So could you just talk a little bit more about communication, both in terms of listening and also in terms of observing. Um, I have to say this is kind of a tricky question. And of course, being this in this pandemic where people tend to communicate more online. So the fact that people communicate online is reduce their self-distress. Um, I think that the problem of communicating, uh, being a good listener and being a good observationer, it's not, it sounds easy, but it's not because you have to pay attention to like the super little things, the micro expression. And because the pandemic, it, it doesn't seem like it's an easy chance. Um, but if you find it hard, you're in the relationship with them, right? You should develop and communicate. You can ask them directly and by giving them a chance, you give yourself a chance too. The observing and the listening is one of the elements as well. But be, but you have to be the conversation starter. So 
So in order to understand them, you have to let yourself explore and you should give yourself a chance. Uh, so I think listening and observing is a great element, but because in this kind of situation, you have to come up with backup plans. So should, you should allow yourself to explore more, not just focusing on things that stuck inside your head. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wan and Prof Professor Ruth for your wonderful question. And thank you, Leslie, for sharing your ideas with us. Now may I ask number seven. Jasmine, are you ready? If you're ready, please go ahead with your presentation. Oh, could you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine and I'm a grade 11 student from Glen Forest Secondary School, Mississauga, Canada. And before I begin my presentation, I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone who has worked hard to make this contest possible and thank you to everyone who has helped me throughout this process. So I joined the 2021 Global Youth Challenge because it provides me with an incredible opportunity to make my voice heard and also to express my opinions regarding how art could help us achieve world peace. Throughout this contest, I learned a lot about what world peace really is, the various obstacles to us achieving world peace, and also I got to try out a new art form, which is collaborative art that I've been always wanting to try out but just didn't have the chance to. So thank you to GYC for that. In my opinion, world peace is when people are able to live together in harmony, have enough resources to maintain a high quality of life, and also to be able to express our opinions freely without being discriminated against. In order for us to achieve this utopia, it is important that we first eliminate the various political, social, and ecological conflicts that are happening all around the world. So, I came to a conclusion that all these issues are caused by the selfish nature of human beings. So what we need to do is to evoke more love and compassion within the hearts of people so that we can reduce selfishness. And art is a great tool that we can use to help us achieve this goal. Because art has a special feature of being universal, which means that unlike languages, we can understand art without having any barriers. So no matter our ethnicity, our ethnicity, our gender, age, and so on, we can all understand art. So knowing that, we can use art to help us improve our communications, we can use art as a tool of advocacy, and we can also use it to educate children about global peace. So firstly, we can use art to improve our communication because everyone can understand art. So this way we can establish more positive relationships between everyone all across the world and this will help to stimulate world peace. Secondly, we can use art as a tool of advocacy because we can use art to raise awareness for the various global issues and really amplify the importance of world peace through art. And thirdly, we can use art as a way of educating children about these complex um, issues that are happening all around the world. Because children are the future, we really need to make sure that we guide these children in the right direction and simplify these concepts and use art as a way of visualizing these complicated ideas for them so that we can ensure that they are going to grow up to be people who are passionate about world peace. So elaborating on this last idea, I actually created a piece of artwork over here and it is called Hot Pot Utopia. So I created it in the style of a child's coloring book and left it uncolored so that I can include a collaborative component. And the two main reasons why I did this was because, first of all, I want to raise awareness for the importance of world peace through my art. And having a collaborative component will allow me to get as many people to think about this topic as possible. And the second reason is that I want to work with people that are around me and establish more positive relationships between us so that we can help to build a more healthy community and really to um, enhance the idea of having positive relationships to stimulate world peace. And over here, you can see a collage of all of my friends creation. And this collage really exemplifies how amazing the results can be when people all work together towards a common goal. So to sum up, I think that world peace is not something that can be achieved through individual efforts. It is really up to us to all work together and use art as a tool to help us to strive towards a common goal of achieving world peace. And I believe that together we can make this happen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jasmine. That was wonderful. Thank you for your artwork. Now may I ask Mr. Colin to present you your first question, please. Yeah, uh, uh, Jasmine, just amazing. I mean, the the artwork. I, I was some, I was never good at art in school, and so that that was a beautiful piece of art. Um, so I think I'm I'm gonna connect kind of question that I asked to the to my previous contestant about um, their favorite author. So for you, do you have any any favorite uh, artists that you can think of that really promote world peace, or or it, it maybe even a piece of artwork that really connects with you as far as um, um, bridging across uh, different cultures and, and promoting world peace. Yeah, of course. So I think a Chinese artist, his name is Ai Weiwei, and he is a Chinese contemporary artist. I think his work is very, very interesting because he actually creates a lot of sculptures. And sculptures are always something that interests me because it is not like a traditional art form, right? So I think that his art is very important in advocating for world peace because for example, one of his art work called, um, I think it was called Safe Passages. It was a life jacket installation that he used from refugees that are actually um, real refugees. And he used their life jackets and put it on um, the poles of a government to manifest to the whole world. So then that installation basically advocates for um, the world peace and how we should care more about the people that are in danger or marginalized, such as the refugees that he used the life jacket installations for. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Sorry, I mixed up my uh, judges question order around, but thank you for your question and thank you, Jasmine. If I can ask Ms. Kelly uh, to ask the next question, please. Hi, Jasmine, uh, beautiful artwork, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed how you you didn't use color. When I first saw it, I was like, what is she doing here? But after reading what you did um, and, and hearing your presentation, it's, it's very well done, thank you. Um, I have a question um, for you. Is it observing artwork um, or is it the creation of artwork that do you um, believe helps people with empathy or is it more of a combination of the two? Yeah, I definitely think it would be a combination of the two. For the people who are willing to create artwork, obviously just putting the thought into creating these artwork, doing their research, and also just thinking about these issues in general would definitely help to promote world peace. But also, um, if you do not want to create artwork, obviously going to a museum to look at these artwork and understanding and appreciating why these, are, why these artists are creating these pieces is also important because understanding the context is always important when we're thinking about issues and everything around us. So yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Kelly. And thank you, Jasmine. Wonderful presentation. Now may I ask number eight, Lisa, Miss Lisa, to start your presentation, please. I would like you to take a moment to think about a child you know. It can be your son, daughter, brother, sister, best friend, or neighbor. Think about how happy you felt to have them in your arms and seeing their little smile. Think about them laughing with their friends as they play outside. What if now you suddenly hear an explosion and you run outside only to find them lying in a pool of their own blood? Unfortunately, this is a reality that often occurs in war-torn countries, a reality that most children in developed countries are completely unaware of. My name is Lisa Vera. I am a Canadian and I wanna create a peaceful world with you. My essay explains that money is invested to manufacture weapons to fight battles when it should be invested to save the innocent people battling the pain to live another day. My video requests adults and educators to teach children about these world issues, why they, why they exist and what the impact is. The Yemen crisis began in 2011 and still occurs today. It, a BBC News article states that the a political transition was set to occur, but while a new president who struggled to face and solve the national issues, a rebel leader allied with unloyal security personnel decided to seize control of Yemen. This has resulted in 75% of Yemen's population to be requiring humanitarian assistance. A crisis has, this crisis has caused children 
to be impacted the most. It is quoted that one child dies every 10 minutes in Yemen. Can you imagine what deep sadness and fear you would feel if that child I told you to think about earlier, if, that, if today would be their last living day? The Yemen crisis has been occurring for 10 years now, but I only learned about it a few years ago. I am fortunate to live in Canada, but I'm truly, truly upset that I was not educated about this this reality that children much, much younger than me have to deal with and face this fear that they feel every single day of their lives. I believe that all school sh systems should teach their students about the current world issues. Through my schooling, I learned about Canada and its history. Yes, learning history is very good and beneficial, but not when it is used to prevent us teaching the children about current world issues. The Yemen crisis is just one of many. There also exists others like Myanmar, Uruguay Muslims, Venezuela, the Afghanistan war, and the Black Lives Movement. We, you may argue that eight-year-olds are far too young to learn about these harsh realities. So why is it that children half their age have to deal with double the amount of horrors than they ever know about? By educating the children and the youth from a young age, they will develop into leaders that want to create a peaceful world for everyone, to let everyone live as happily and safely and peacefully as they do themselves. Exposing the harsh truth to children now will ensure that the future holds peace and resolution. Science and engineering has been used to create weaponry in the past, but it is now time for a change. Instead, build technology that will detect and diffuse bombs and landmines. We can even build filtration devices that will clean the contaminated water and resources. Stop spending millions on killing machines. Start spending it on life-saving machines. I want you to join me and to use your voice to bring attention to these world issues that occur today. We always talk about the freedom of speech, but how can we give others freedom if we don't speak? Educate children about the world conflicts and the racism that still occurs. Please don't avoid teaching us this truth because otherwise we'll just repeat the circle of uneducated youth. By teaching children now, there will eventually be a happier life for everyone on earth. Empowering the youth today will allow them to develop into leaders that want to become peaceful and bring safety to everyone. Please stand with me to educate children about the worldly conflicts until they cease, because together we can all build world peace. Thank you for your listening and your attention. Thank you, Lisa. That was wonderful, a wonderful and passionate speech. Now I would like to ask Mr. Vanderkur to ask you a first question, okay? Okay, I had prepared some questions, but this was, uh, <laughs> that was very powerful, very powerful. And uh, so let me just, uh, there's a number of questions I would have here, but um, what, would be, what would be your opinion on the way uh, financial markets affect peace around the world? So financial markets, there are definitely different approaches that they take to like spread their their company around the world spread their like vision about their company but i believe that if they put in both more peaceful approaches and aspects into their their work that they are creating and spreading globally that they can really imp impact the whole entire society and benefit the world to become more peaceful as well as that they're going to become well known so it benefits them as well as the world so with the financial issues like the that some countries are not as rich or wealthy as others they can instead i believe that developed countries should help out to the less like less wealthy countries and provide them with that support that they need with the guidance and that just helping to contribute themselves into their own lives and helping them to bring out the best that that other country could possibly be also, I believe that these developed countries should also educate the youth and the children about what they are doing to help contribute these other countries. Like I know in, um, in when, back at, when I was in elementary school, 
because of what happened to Haiti, we, our school decided that we would get milk bags. Milk bags are what you find in Canada for milk. And so they was used to create and weave like beds for the people who had lost their homes in Haiti. So I believe that using the finance from the, like from developed countries can really mm -hmm. benefit the countries who are struggling through these world crises and really improve their economy like that, their strength and build peace around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, uh, in investment decisions also affect the production of armaments. And so I thought you might tackle that too. That was very, you know, that was such a powerful uh, speech. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. And next we'll have uh, Professor Ruth to present you your second question, Lisa. Yeah, hi, Lisa. It was certainly a very striking uh, presentation and I couldn't agree more. I have been very connected to uh, Yemen at this time. And so your emphasis beginning with what is going on there and has gone on, as you said, for more than 10 years was so important. And I absolutely agree, Thank children you. need to know about this. But I wonder if you could say something about organizations that are on the ground making a difference and how children can think both in terms of giving and also in terms of future careers. The one that I'm particularly uh, connected to in terms of Yemen is Doctors Without Borders, MSF. But there are many other such organizations which are there trying to save the children from the bombs on the streets and support and the medical emergencies and so on. And it seems to me education about what they're doing and how children in Canada can participate in that is also key. So if you could just comment on that. So I agree that there are definitely a lot of organizations out there that are benefiting the world, trying to bring peace to everyone, helping those are, that are struggling and in need and really need humanitarian assistance. They are helping to save these lives so they can live as peacefully as like people in developed countries do, such as me. Like in Canada, we live very, very freely. And I know that there are organizations like the UN, UNICEF, UNESCO. There, like you mentioned, Doctors Without Borders, there's Free the Children. There's all these different organizations that help to not only help uh, the children and the the people, the population in these in these underdeveloped countries and these war-torn areas, but also they educate the children in every country to help them become more leaders and become just change their mindset into becoming more morally responsible, becoming a better, stronger. They want to use their voice for good. They want to bring peace to the world, help those in need. So then eventually everyone will finally live a peaceful life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Lisa. That was very passionate. Thank you very much. And now, before Daryl announces our appreciation to our fellow supporters, I would like to let everyone know that we would like to thank our MP, which is in Canada, Member of Parliament, uh, Mr. Ellie for Willowdale, as well as our MPP, which is Member of Provincial Parliament, Mr. Logan for Markham and Thornhill, as well as Mr. Vincent for Down Valley North. Thank you for their support of GYC, and we appreciate their support. Now, Daryl, please go ahead. I announce our thank you to our uh, partners. Okay, I'd like to thank the following for their support. Centennial College, Banshawi College, Cambrian College, IDP Education Canada, Xi'an Foreign Language School, Experimental Middle School attached to Yunnan Normal University, Toronto Central Academy, Edu Line Academy, Can Honor Overseas, Global Education Alliance, Shanghai 360, Educational Investment Company Limited, Studi Academy, Wonder Lutz, International Language Center, Can Achieve International Education, Can Honor Overseas, Shiny Way Education. Thank you very much for my corporate and educational sponsors. Also, I want to thank the finalists 
five to seven for their inspirational speeches. Next, we will go on to group three, finalists nine to 12. Finalist nine, Manar Nan Nasir. Finalist 10, Michael Zhang. Finalist 11, Rex Zhu. Finalist 12, Run Lang Hu. And the panelists, judges, Professor Wang will be judging finalist nine and George. For finalist 10, we have judges Kelly and Colin. For finalist 11, we have judges Professor Hayhole and Professor Wang. Finalist 12, we have George again and Kelly. Thank you very much, finalists and speakers. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, I'm take it away. Yes, please take it away, finalist number nine. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I would like to say I am so grateful for this opportunity to present my thoughts to the world and to meet like-minded youth. Thank you for this opportunity to grow and challenge myself. My name is Manar bin Nasser, and I am from a small country in the northern Africa called Tunisia. For this competition, I wrote an essay about the future because I am, and I am pretty sure that I am not alone, curious about how would the world look like in a hundred years or maybe in a thousand years. Have you ever thought about the impact of our actions on the future generations? How often do we keep the outcome in our minds when we make a decision? What if our children and our grandchildren can tell us about our consequences of our actions on the future generations? Well, this essay is imagining an encounter with the humans from the future while we seek advice from them and how we can shift our attitude to reach a better outcome. We Although we as a humans, we have made so many mistakes. We cannot deny that and probably still will. I do believe that, I do believe that uh, in, we can improve our decisions and, to, and create a better future to the, to the next generations. Also, I really believe that peace is not so far away from us. Of course, if we choose to attain it. I think that we are perfectly capable to, to innovate and come up with solutions to our existing, pro, existing problems. Uh, we can certainly rely on our brilliant minds and compassionate hearts to grow and evolve. So how can we reach that? I mean, how can we shape the future? That is the quest. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Now I would like to ask Professor Wang to present you your first question. Well, thank you, Maina, for your um, very um, um, sort of a challenging um, thing. Uh, me as a scientist, I think, okay, so now what should I do? Like, uh, how could we as a scientist, um, you know, sort of a way we make an advancement in science and technology, um, you know, to make it, yeah. how to actually promote global peace rather than sometimes being abused or sometimes we even think about our social responsibility there, right? So, I mean, in your mind, what would you suggest me to do? Like, uh, how do I, what do I do? I'm a biologist, right? So I study environment biology and that sort of thing. So like I say, if you were to come to me and say, hey, okay, what, like, how should I do it? I mean, no, you put it in the fiction in a way, it's very nice, but I like to hear more practically, like a you know, realistic, how you convince a scientist like myself to do so. It's a good question, actually. I thought about it before, so I have some uh, some solutions to this. Uh, before we we as humans, we have created so many weapons to kill our brother 
others and to torture his soul. So what if we change these innovations to a useful thing, to promote our love and to respect each other? What, what if we create a ship that, that save all the children killed in wars? What if we can create a new planet, a new planet in the space? just to save our children, of course, to, because they are, they are the next generations. I think that we are capable to do that. We have the ultimate power to create our future and the, we have the ultimate power to write the human history. And the biological and the, the nuclear weapons and replace it by uh, something else like uh, more technological. Theoretically, we can do we can do that like movies, create a new planet peacefully. Right. Thanks, Mana. Thank you, Professor. May I ask uh, Mr. George Vanderker to ask the next question, please. George, you need to unmute your mic, please. There. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. That's me, <laughs> forgetful. Um, so, Manny, you, you got uh, <clears throat> two, two science people to ask you questions. And I, I got really excited when I saw the initial uh, that you were going to go into a black hole. I thought, wow, this is going to be a really great piece of, of science fiction, you know, tied to reality. And that was very creative. I really enjoyed that. Um, could you give me an example of maybe something uh, that exists in technology today that would not be destructive, but it would actually be helpful in promoting world peace? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, we have made, uh, we have made, and I am talking uh, uh, as a human, we have made so many planet, uh, so many plane. I mean, uh, uh, can can uh, uh, wait? <laughs> I lost connection. Wait. Let us know. I know we can still hear you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. I repeat. The, we can, uh, did you hear me? Yes, I can hear you a little bit, yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Maybe muted for some. Okay. Humans have made so many innovations to, to promote uh, our technology and to, uh, to promote our, uh, our science fiction creations. So we have, uh, uh, I can uh, uh, I can suggest that human can and scientists can uh, create a, a shell maybe can uh, can protect the planet can protect the planet and not to be distracted by the uh, the outer dangers from the space and maybe the dangers from the aliens or maybe it's something else. I do believe in aliens and black holes. <laughs> okay, you don't want to go into a black hole though, because it's going to make, it's going to make you, I, I'm very tall by the way, I'm, I'm two meters tall, but if you went into a black hole, you would become even taller. <laughs> it, was, it would stretch you. <laughs> I think so. Thank you, it was very creative. Well, thank you very much, yes. Well. Thank you, Manor, and thank you to judges for your questions. Before we begin um, to the next one, to Michael, I would like to remind everybody, we are also having a very nice vote for the most populous finalists. So the link is shared in the chat box. So if you, uh, if you want to vote for your favorite finalist, please do so, and you can check the address in the chat box below. Now, Michael, are you ready to go? I'm ready, thank you. Okay, go ahead, sir. So there are many definitions of world peace, but I consider world peace as a state in which all nations become willing to solve all conflicts peacefully. However, how do we achieve this goal? While it seems counterintuitive, the way to achieve world peace is through conflicts themselves. 
Humanity has to use issues and problems to achieve the necessary resolve and motivation to work together. The past can serve as examples to show how nations should work as a whole. Mutual issues can help bring nations together and productive conflicts can allow humanity to progress together and improve relationships. Currently, the main reason why humanity is struggling to create peace is that we are not using peaceful solutions to solve conflicts. The idea is that using violent and aggressive methods will force others into submission, but violence and hatred do not result in peace. As an example, after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles was a harsh punishment against Germany. Using hostility to end World War I by severely punishing the Germans was one of the catalysts that caused World War II. It did not solve any conflicts or send a message to the world. The Treaty of Versailles caused a second, even more terrible global conflict. So what is the best solution to resolve disputes? Well, the answer comes by looking in the past again. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. were peaceful protesters that became cemented in history for their efforts. They're, their methods inspired millions more to protest peacefully and show the world that love and peace are valid methods in solving disputes. People need to use the past to find examples of the best solution to solve current conflicts. The second way conflicts can help achieve world peace is with mutual disputes, meaning both sides are interested in solving the same problem. Currently, one of the most well-known mutual conflicts is global warming. The issue with solving the conflict of global warming is that each side is too busy blaming the other for their contribution to climate change or their lack of contribution to solving climate change. However, there is still some good news as we have all at least recognized that global warming is a global threat that we need to resolve, and we must continue on this path. If the nations can work together and contribute to solving this crisis, it will be a milestone towards achieving world peace. It will serve as an example to show how that nations can work together to solve conflicts. We need to take away our political views in favor of recognizing mutual destruction. We need to realize that humanity is more important than a single country's interest. Finally, productive conflicts are an open exchange of an ideas in which each party feels equally respected and involved. No party is afraid to voice their concerns and can reach a mutually comfortable solution. This type of conflict is our end goal. If we can achieve a world in which all international disputes become productive conflicts, we can confidently say that we have achieved world peace. During the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis nearly ended up in a nuclear war. However, it didn't because both countries believed in mutually assured destruction. Thus, they were able to come to an agreement and find a suitable solution. The first step in creating a productive conflict is by finding common ground. The next steps are making sure each side feels included and respected, and finally creating a mutually beneficial solution. We need to turn all international conflict into productive conflicts, since in humanity's futures, there will always be some conflict to solve. Having a world where no conflicts exist is not possible, but we can achieve a world where all problems are solved peacefully. We need to use peaceful solutions, find mutual interest, and have productive conflicts as emerging strategies to resolve current and future disputes. Let us remember the tragedy of war and learn from past conflicts as examples of how we should solve disputes. Let us identify mutual conflicts to find nations common interests and to work together as a whole. And let us turn conflicts into productive conflicts to allow each nation to be recognized and involved in determining resolutions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was wonderful and very passionate as well. Now your first question will come from Ms. Kelly. Kelly, go ahead, please. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, it was a great essay that I read. Um, I enjoyed how you brought in some science aspects into, into your writing, so thank you. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about, I, I, I agree with your framework in, in having two countries to work together, um, but as history has taught us, sometimes the need um, for power causes conflict. And so using your framework of countries working together, how would this initiative work for countries that are just looking to gain more power and control? Yeah, so again, one of the uh, major contributions to like war is greed. Obviously some countries want to, they want to get more resources. They want to keep growing and growing and growing. And unfortunately these with these types of countries, it is, really difficult to come to an appropriate resolution because how can you how can you find an appropriate solution if you if nothing is enough if nothing's enough how can you find a solution so at that point the basic way is to always try to find some way to make sure that country to find out like change their ideology change their idea like try to stop them from looking for more power try to find ways to get the country 
in order to get the idea that they don't need everything and that each country, like they can all coexist together. Now, yeah, there are some power, like there are some power um, hungry countries, but at the same time, I don't feel like like they were always going to stay power hungry. At, at one point, there's going to be enough. One point, you're going to have to find a solution that can help each country feel respected. As long as they feel respected and they feel involved, I feel like all countries can find a way to create peace. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for your question. Now, I'm not going to be asking you to list who's the power hungry countries. <laughs> That'd be... No, 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 we won't do that. <laughs> so your second question will come from Mr. Colin from Brock. Colin, go ahead, please. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Michael. I, I really liked how, you know, you're, you're talking about the importance of, of um, countries coming together to find mutually beneficial solutions. You talked about that meaningful, mutually beneficial approach several times. Um, but, but, you know, sometimes there, there are conflicts where there is not a mutually beneficial outcome. So, so what do you do in those circumstances? How, how do you achieve peace when there's not a mutually beneficial outcome? I think with those types of solutions, the best way to help um, help keep all the sides happy is by having some kind of future compensation having some or having something like there's a mutually like I guess we can use global warming as an example right now you can say with China the reason why they're not really happy with having to shift to all renewable energy is because they're still developing they're not like unlike US unlike all these other countries they're not developed yet so it feels kind of like hypocritical to say no you're not allowed to develop because you're contributing to climate change but that's the same way we got to our developed state mm -hmm. so in order to help, like, we have to have some kind of compensation, something like, okay, we will give you some more resources, or we will help you get along with this, or like, find some kind of way to basically give a motive to help them uh, bring to a mutually assured a solution, mutual solution. Because yes, it's true, there's sometimes you can't reach a solution where everyone is happy, but you can reach a way that you can compensate for the countries that are not happy for it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Now I would like to invite Rex. Rex Sue, if you're ready to go, go ahead with your can presentation. You hear me? Yes, I yes, we can. Can I share my screen, please? Like I have a slideshow prepared. Okay, sure. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Uh, before I start, I just want to say thank you to GYC for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to present my thoughts. So, hi, I'm Rex. Today I will be discussing climate change and its direct influence on global peace. And in this speech, I will talk about why it's so important to pay enough attention, that we have to pay enough attention to climate change and its connection with global peace. Uh, did you know that if we don't do anything right now, uh, to help solve climate change by the mid 21st century, we'll have 8 million coastal population losing their homes. Uh, climate change is the biggest enemy to global peace. Climate change causes sea level rising and increasing numbers of hurricanes. If coastal countries and economies become damaged by these problems, it will bring a more intense international relationship because many nations will be in a very unstable state. Uh, I have three reasons why it's so important uh, that we have to pay enough attention to it. First one is the migration of the coastal population. As we just mentioned, there will be 8 million people losing their homes and over 500 coastal cities will be affected by the issue. But then, coastal population will migrate inland and causing entire society and country to be in a very unstable state. Um, the second reason is economy. The subsequent economical loss due to migration will be gigantic because we currently have about 50% of the global population live within 200 kilometers from the coastline. In addition, it is a very big threat to coastal countries' economy. Uh, it is a, for example, Japan's fishing industry on the northern coast has experienced a huge loss due to climate change. Uh, their salmon catch has decreased by 70% over the past 15 years. Uh, my third reason is agriculture. Due to sea level rising, uh, salt water is entering and harming coastal agricultural land and crops. Uh, many crops are highly salt sensitive. Uh, 
Soon there will all be coastal countries start having shortages in food. If the problem of climate change and sea level rising is not solved, this will all be a very serious problem and it will cause famine in the coastal countries. Um, what can we do? Uh, it seems like there's nothing we can do individually, but we shouldn't think that way. We each have a responsibility to fulfill as a member of Earth. We should walk or bike more when the distance is not too far. We don't have to drive to reach any destination. Uh, these are, and we can turn off the light when we're leaving the room. And these are out helpful in terms of reducing carbon emission and a green, green gas emission. Uh, and there's a lot we can do to take action to help solve climate change. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Rex. I can hear your frustration regarding global warming and how that is affecting global peace. Yeah. Now I would like to invite Professor Ruth Hayhold to ask you your first question. Thank you, Rex. I think you picked a really important topic. I actually have a niece, Catherine Ayo. She's on radio often, CBC and also in the US, talking about this. And when asked, what is the most important thing we can do? Because I think that question of yours is a really key one. She has an interesting answer, which is talk about it every day. She feels right. people don't pay enough attention. So I want to ask you, in your experience in school, how many days, how often is this issue brought up in the class so that you actually talk about it and think about what you It really depends do. on what class. Uh, if it's class like um, uh, that talks about social study, uh, they talk, to, talk about climate change very often. But other than that, I don't think they talk about climate change. And I really hope that uh, school or the uh, education department can put more information about climate change and its importance into a textbook or class content. Thank you. I think that's really important to get it into the textbook, not only in social science, but even more in the natural sciences. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Professor. Now may I ask another professor, a scientist, Professor Wang, to ask you your second question, please. Well, thanks, Rax, for, um, for that wonderful um, presentation. I'm, I'm so happy because I do work on climate change and a lot of environment issues myself. Um, as, apart from personal interest, I, I think that one of the greatest challenges nowadays is um, actually that people don't even believe in there are climate change, right? So like not human caused climate change. There's a, let alone to rank it as a, you know, you rank it as a greatest threat to um, global peace. So I'm just wondering how, I mean, you present a lot of facts, but how would you present that? Like consider that as the greatest challenge. Like getting people having enough attention to the problem. Uh, I, I think the biggest, uh, oh. So you think that's a be above ideology conflict and above the political, all this business conflict and all these other things? I mean, that's sort of a hypothetical question. Like, uh, like how do I get their attention? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I would say uh, people like Elon Musk, he is emphasizing, I mean, he's a very famous celebrity, right? So he's keep emphasizing the importance of using clean energy, which I think we need more people like Elon Musk to talk on the news media and emphasize the importance of, because they have lots of fans, right? They, their fans really pay lots of attention to their opinion. So I think we need more people like Elon Musk. That, 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 would, be, that, that would be my solution to the problem. Have you celebrity talk? You about do believe, that? you do think, you know, um, climate change is the greatest challenge to global peace. So, above every other things. I, I think so. I think so. It, it, might, it, it might cause like uh, famine in the coastal area where countries might have to fight for resources because they're having food shortages or et cetera. And that they have to fight for it. It's more likely that they're going to have conflicts. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Rex. You did wonderful. Now, if I may ask the next contestant. So finalist number 12, Mr. Ho, to start your uh, presentation, please. Okay, hello, everyone. My name, my name is Sri Long, and first I want to thank all, all of the judges here and the 16 contestants. 
uh, it's really nice to be here and to present my ideas that uh, could change the world. And with our little effort that we could make the world a better place. So have you ever thought about uh, why people always put their hands on their heart when they feel something or they, they say that they believe in each other, they feel something, they're even feeling hurt. And have you ever heard a phrase that my brain told me that my brain is the most important thing in our body? Isn't that really funny? Have you ever thought about why ancient Egyptians keep a dead people's heart instead of their brains? Not only that, many of our ancient cultures have indicated that our heart is where our spirit dwells. And that's the most important thing in our lives. Our heart is not only a pump of our blood, but also a fountain of our lives. So you may ask why I'm saying this. Is it actually relevant to global peace? Of course it is. In my opinion, it is really hard to change others, but why don't you change yourself first? So. Uh, I believe the reason why we haven't achieved the global peace yet is because that we don't have enough love and we are all blended by all the outside world that touches the feelings and the smells, the taste of outside world. And that's the only electrical signals that brain told us. I'm not saying that uh, ignore those feelings. No, I'm saying that be aware of the outside world, but feel it with your heart. That's the most important thing. So here I am uh, presenting to you my three little steps that could improve on world peace. So first, uh, make a little list uh, on a piece of paper every night just to list three things uh, of the most amazing scene, the most like the sunset or the most amazing people, uh, art piece that you see uh, for today. And then second, uh, make three things that um, you did that make you very proud. That is really important because you have to feel confident and love yourself then to love the world. Third, the most uh, interesting part is that you will have to share it the next time, next morning, the first thing in the morning. You can share it on moments on Instagram, on any social media like Facebook or anything. Cause that when you write on the list paper, that list of paper, that paper changes. That's not only just the list, but it contains your love to the world. And that love is power. And this power can accumulate through time and you can pass on to one another. You share it with your friends and your friends could feel it. And if they feel it, they know what to do. So um, it's hard to change others, but we can change ourselves. So I heard, uh, uh, talking uh, last night, I would say it's really easy to be heartless, but it takes a lot to care. And I think if you feel with your heart, you will care that every living creature and non-living creature uh, on the in the world, and you will feel it. Then we don't need to start wars. We don't have to uh, impose tax more taxes on poor people. That we can. Uh, achieve global peace. So why don't we start today? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Vanderker, would you like to present your question to uh, contestant number 12, please? Well, you have presented a real dilemma because, and I agree with you 100%, you, can, you cannot change others. <laughs> you can only change yourself. And so, um, and you did talk about a couple of strategies, but could you suggest maybe one strategy that's top of your mind where you can influence people to change themselves. In a way that's, I guess you are trying to change them, but is there a way of influencing people to you know, do that? And I know that uh, when it comes to uh, say conflicts within marriages and stuff like that, you go to a counselor and you, you kind of uh, learn how to change yourself. So what are your ideas on that? Uh, yeah, this is actually related to my submission. I submit an artwork, a music piece that I, I created. Because yes. I think uh, other from languages and uh, other uh, artwork, I think music is the one you can work into others' heart. Because uh, somehow people will relate it to the music. So I created music that just like people uh, to know, to feel um, the power of love and uh, I think that would change 
not change that will influence people a little by little from every day. So I will continue to work on my art piece, and uh, I think uh, I will like more people to see. I just registered to uh, Wang Yi to become a musician uh, officially. So thank you for your support, and uh, I think I will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, George, for your uh, question. Now may I ask Kelly to share her question with on contestant number 12, please. Thank you. Um, your um, song was beautiful. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, believe that, uh, same with you, that music does um, bring more love and empathy into the world. Um, I wanted to ask you why you think um, the arts and humanities are so important to world peace. Um, because as we can see from a long time ago, from like ancient time that we kept our drawings on the walls uh, and that sort of keeps the information from uh, the prehistoric ages to here. That's we could know what's uh, going on like uh, in time before. And I think uh, the art related to the world piece is because that uh, the thing is our creation because many people think they are too normal to just do something to to change the world, but no, everybody is important. And I think we should change every individual. We could influence them. We could inspire them from artwork, from all the things that we can create, like poems, like songs, the lyrics, and everything. And I think to them, people realize that they could make an effort. They could like uh, create music piece, they could write some poems just like everybody else. And that I think is most important. Everybody is thinking positively. Everybody is uh, looking forward to the future so that we can make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, um, Soho. Now we're gonna take a look, as we mentioned before, that we have some voting going on. So let's take a look who our audience selected to be the favorite finalist. We still have time to uh, vote. So let's take a look. Um, Anton or Nancy, would you please share your screen and let everyone take a look at who's at the lead, okay? Okay, Daryl, would you like to take a look and let everyone know who's in the lead for the most populous finalist? Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Wow, it's getting close. Uh, it's like a horse race there. We have Manor in the front, 37%. Just behind her is Leslie, 24%. And then followed by Helena, those are the three front runners. Next we have Lisa Berra, and then Amy, Yihang Fan, Zhe Yu Lu, Yu Shu Long, Iman Ali Saeed, Barbara Rodriguez, Jasmine Hu, Chelsea Mu Wati, Michael Zhang, Yu Fei Zhao, Rek Zhu, and Mr. Hu. Now, don't worry, folks, we still have time to vote. Keep voting. The race is not done yet. I used to be a runner. It's not done until the last lap. <laughs> so don't <laughs> give up on your voting, folks. Keep voting. Yeah, thank you, Daryl. And I think everyone's doing great. Thank you for sharing your time. And thank you to the judges for your wonderful question. Daryl, would you like to introduce the next group of uh, finalists to us, please? Okay, here we go. And I, yeah, these speeches keep getting better and better. So, so thank you everybody for your insightful speeches. So next we have group four. This is the last group, the last group. So finalist 13, we have Yeheng Fan, followed by finalist 14, Yi Shu Lu Long, Finalist 15, Yu Fei Zhao. Finalist 16, Zi Yu Lu. And finalist 13 will be judged by Colin and Professor Hei Ho. Finalist 14 will be judged by Professor Wang and George. Finalist 15 will be judged by Kelly and Colin. 
And finalist 16 by George and Professor Wang. Take it away, folks. Okay, uh, Yihan Fan, Felix, go ahead and start your presentation. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. My name is Yihan Fan. I come from Beijing, China, and I'm currently studying at Iron Dell Academy in Toronto. I'm really honored to be invited to today's final competition. And I really wanna thanks to all the judges and organizers for giving me this valuable opportunity to express my ideas for the world peace. So the topic for my submission is how education will help the world a peaceful place. From my perspective, developing education is the most efficient way to solve the conflicts and wars in today's world. I have done lots of research on the world peace topic while I was writing my essays and I sum up three main points why education is effective for the world peace. Firstly, education is most in, can, will improve the awareness of anti-war by passing correct values to people. No one is born with hate, no one is born a racist. Most of values and ideologies that people have were usually shaped by the environment or people's labor they are exposed to. Therefore, people are easily influenced by some biased media, irresponsible reporting, or some politicalized uh, uh, reporting by media. And those things will definitely incite the confrontation between different countries and different groups. For example, last year, there was lots of animosity towards the Asians in the United States because of the media. That is why we need developing education. Secondly, let's think about what are the main causes of war. Well, according to my research, the top, the top three reasons of the wars are territorial gain, economics gain, and resource gain. All those three reasons indicate that the nature of the war, which is uneven allocation of resources. And there, but however, there is no political system in the world today that can achieve a relatively fair distribution of resources. Inversely, the gap between the rich and the poor continually growing, and it will be eventually become a field of conflict. Therefore, we need to education to help us find a better way for the human civilization. Lastly, education can promote the social development and thus bring stability. Education is a still a scarce source in many developing countries. Lots of teenagers in those countries cannot accept a formal education might easily commit crimes. Besides that, because of lack of education, every aspect of those countries include, includes economics, environment, and education will absolutely be affected and gradually become a virtual circle. Uh, so today, I'm here to call on the whole world. In order to achieve the world peace, we should be united and committed to the development of education so as to guide and set a good model for the young generations. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Ihan. Now, uh, Mr. Colin will present you your question, okay? Go ahead, Colin, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Yihan. Um, I, I really like the line in your submission where you talked about the the importance of, of moral education, how more, moral education is incredibly important, but it's the most easily neglected. I thought that was quite well said. So if you were to incorporate um, better or, or um, improved moral education into curriculum, what would that look like? What, what values do you think we need to um, instill in our youth to improve their moral character and, and moral education? Uh, so basically what I believe is that we need to give the, some people some basic objectively a correct value. You know, there's like, I know in Western uh, education system, uh, uh, the people are always being encouraged by to like, uh, do some critical thinking, but sometimes there's some uh, there's some things that is objectively correct, and so that we need to promote those things, just as such as respect the science and respect the other race, uh, something like that. Things like um, that, cause like there's 
like just because they always believe that what they believe but we we so i think we have we have to have uh, the some courses like the moral courses to uh, educate people what is the correct value like it is really general topic so yeah thank you thank you colin now may i ask professor ruth hanhol to ask the second question please Yes, uh, thank you so much, Yihang, for your presentation. I have been studying China's education for many, many, many years and trying to persuade people in the West to understand and learn from it. So I wonder if you could take maybe two very concrete examples out of your own experience of education of what you see as being really important for education for peace that the Western world could learn from. Uh, yes, I like as mentioned in the uh, like as mentioned in the uh, in my essay, and you know like as I said the uh, moral which is this I think one uh, course that uh, Western country should be improved is the moral education, which means that like we know we got uh, the tremendous course selection such as we got the English, uh, we got math, we got science, but there's no uh, uh, courses can teach the student some the values and ideal values and then some correct values. For example, like respect the other race, as I mentioned before, like so that all the inform, like all the, their beliefs was kind of formed by the social, formed by the social media or like uh, the, their parents, but I think the school should take this responsibility to do so. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ruth, and thank you, uh, Yihan Felix. You did wonderful. Now, may I ask number 14, Ms. Long, Yi Shu Long, if you can start your presentation whenever you're ready, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Shu Long, and I'm honored to get this chance from GYC. The topic I want to talk about today is gain world peace through self-improvement and independence. Let's start from a question first. Do you want to, uh, um, do you want to be hurt not only physically, but also mentally? Do you want to live in wars? Do you want to lose your dear family and your best friends? Your answer must be no. In this world, no one wants to suffer, go through wars, and even to be separated from their loved ones. Everyone loves world peace and we all need it. But what should we do? As long as you look at the history, it's not hard for us to find that only when countries and nations are strong enough People can be protected well, and we can realize the world peace. The power of a country or a nation comes from politics, economy, and culture. Just like in World War I and World War II, hundreds and millions of people died. Thousands and hundreds of people lost their homes because Powerful countries grabbed resources and limited energy from those weak countries and passed on their economic crisis to them by starting wars. Think about it. What if those weak countries become self-reliant and independent? What if the every country have political independent and economic development? What if all the people are proud of their own cultures. This kind of situation may never happen again. There will be no fights, no, no arguments, there will be no wars and no discrimination. There will be only a beautiful, peaceful world. World peace is not a dream. As a Chinese saying goes, where there is a will, there is a way. 
you're not given a good day or a bad life. We are all given a life. It's up to us to make it good or bad. We can make the world peace come true. Let's stand together and work tirelessly. And world peace is waiting for us not far away. This is all the content of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Ishu. I think you did great. Don't be nervous. Okay, um, just calm down a little bit. Don't be nervous. We'll have the judges to ask you two questions. Okay, the first question will come from Professor Wang. Would you please kindly ask your question, sir? Well, thank you for your presentation. That was very interesting. Um, so, so I, I, I guess this may be a bit tougher question. So if we think countries should become self-reliant and then uh, independent, that's kind of in contrary to what we call the globalization, that sort of thing. So, so in your mind, so if, if this self-reliance cannot be achieved, um, so are we saying there will be less chance for global peace, <laughs> you think? So you um, think every country should become self-reliant to, to oh, you know, become independent there so in order to achieve global peace? Then? Is that what? Um, I mean? Yes. Um, I mean, um, every country, uh, every nation, every people should be self-reliant and independent. And just like if you are strong enough, then nobody can beat you. Um, I mean... If you want to win, you need to make yourself strong enough. And I think this is a good way for us to make world peace come true. Okay, so I, I'm i more thinking about, this is just my personal view. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily become self-reliance. I think a country, there are big countries, strong countries, not so strong countries. I think it's about helping each other and they've, you know, sort of a lending hand to each other. So I like mutually beneficial. So that actually helps to bring the harmony rather than, you know, everybody becomes their so little Ford. I, I'm sure that's not what you meant, but um, that's what I kind of a leaning toward personally. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for sharing your personal view. Uh, I think we all have our own ideas about how global peace may be achieved. And thank you, Ishu, for sharing your views as well. Now may I ask Mr. Vandeker George to present you your second question, okay? I'm sorry, George, you need to unmute your mic again. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. <laughs> you should, that was very good. I really enjoyed that. And I, I like the use of a Chinese uh, proverb. I want to give you a proverb from my culture, which is not Canada, but it, and, uh, this is what it says. If you can't do the way you must do it, then you must do it the way you can do it. <laughs> and uh, that's from uh, a place called Friesland in, in the Netherlands. Anyway, so uh, when, when I was uh, a bit younger than you, uh, world peace was probably more important to young people than anything else. We were, we were taught to hide under desks in case there would be a nuclear uh, uh, attack, that kind of thing. And then when I got a little bit older, say in the 70s, prosperity seemed to take over. Everybody, you know, everybody was well off and people were more interested in prosperity. So where you are in, in, the, in the place you are today, how do young people feel? Is peace more important or future or prosperity? And maybe they're not mutually exclusive. Um, I think it's really a good question, but um, I can't understand it uh, uh, quite um, um, constantly. And could you repeat it again? Okay. I'm sorry yes. for it. Yeah, okay, as a young person in your environment is, uh, for, for your friends and yourself, is mm -hmm. prosperity a bigger issue 
or the prospect of world peace a bigger issue? In other words, are you more fearful of combat or more fearful of poverty? Well, do you understand the question issue? So is having enough food for you important? Or is it someone coming in your home and invading your home and you're in a war and unstable situation more important to you? May I clarify like that, George? Sure, that's good, yeah. What do you think? I think she's having a little bit of difficulty. Um, would you like to try to perhaps simplify that for, uh, for her? So I, I, thought you, I thought your example was very good, uh, uh, Christine, because, because world peace, uh, prosperity and peace are not necessarily, uh, uh, cannot happen together because people will, will, if they want, if they're greedy, as one of our earlier uh, present presenters, also from Asia, I think, uh, mentioned the, mentioned the uh, greed as, as being a, uh, negative thing and so greed is based on wanting to be prosperous but on the other hand if you're in other some of our other presenters I could tell they were living in a slightly different part of the world where peace was really much more important to them than prosperity so I'm just thinking in the environment that you're in Yishu where you live do you feel stronger about peace or stronger about prosperity not necessarily yourself but just the friends you see around you Prosperity. Cross Richness. Being rich. Being rich or being a poor? No. Do you being, mean that? Being, being rich or being safe? Oh, oh I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I prefer being safe. Um, actually, you can, um, money is important for us. But we can't always make money in an important um, level because you can't pay money by house, you can pay money by a car, uh, you can buy a lot of things, but you cannot buy your family, your friends, or time. So, um, but for safe, I mean, I don't want a guy uh, who came in my, uh, who, who, opened my doors and shot me. And I want to live in a safe country. I want to have a safe home. And also my friends around me, they also talk about this to me uh, before. And they think, they, they thought, um, if you don't have money, you can earn it. Later, you can earn it by your, um, by your work. You can work tirelessly. But if but for your life, you only have one, one, you only live once. So you cannot do it again. So I think safe is much important than the rich. And that's my idea. Thank you. That's very thank you. That's very good. I'm sorry about the communication problem because uh, when I was a little boy, I did not speak English either. So you, knowing every word is, uh, is sometimes difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Isu. I think you did wonderful. I moved to Canada when I was young as well. I also had a language problem, but uh, <laughs> that is something that we can work together and solve. Yeah. And as a part of globalization, we can all hopefully understand each other better and in a more harmonious way. Thank you, Isu. Now I would like to invite Yi Fei Zhou to begin her presentation. Uh, well, um, hello everyone. I am Yi Fei Zhou from China, and I would like to thank um, I would like to thank all the teachers from GYC for holding such a competition for our uh, for us teenagers uh, to build friendship uh, with each other. So let me begin my presentation, please. Uh, First of all, let me tell you three numbers. Two million, six million, and 23 million. What could you think of according to them? Actually, these simple numbers can lead to a sad truth. During the recent decade, about two million children were killed in war. 
6 million of them became orphans, and 23 million lost their homes. These facts are showing us, even in today's highly developed human civilization, the war is still doing a great deal of harm to the physical and mental health of children, and we must deal with this problem. A photographer once took such a photo. A skinny little girl was lying in the weeds with a vulture waiting behind her. This photo was taken in Sudan, a country which was torn by war. Another famous photo taken in Syria shows a child staring at the camera in great fear. She bit her lip and raised her hands because she thought the camera lens was a gun about to shoot her. When we look at these pictures, we might feel that these things are pretty far from our lives. But in fact, thousands of similar things are happening all over the world. Children, which have been a symbol of love and future, are the biggest victims during the war. What can we do to protect children from war? In my opinion, we should try to prevent war from happening as hard as we could. As teenagers, we should learn and respect the history and culture from other countries, because lack of understanding and misunderstanding between different groups are often a common cause of, of conflict. A good way is to communicate with teenagers around the world to create friendship. We can do this through some online platforms like Facebook and YouTube or taking part in some international events. These platforms offer us with a chance to build good relationship between teams from different countries. We need to study hard from now on in order to use the knowledge in the future. For example, if we learn about psychology, we can help the children who are scared or deeply traumatized in the war. Uh, besides, we can support charity events to help children in need. Also, we can tell people around us about how important it is to pay attention to the living situation of children in war. I believe that if we keep doing this, the number of wars will drop and will make it closer to a future where every child can live happily without fear and has a chance to achieve his or her dream. Why don't we start taking action now? Thanks for listening. Thank you, Yufei, that was wonderful. So if I may ask Ms. Kelly to ask you your first question, okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, that was a great presentation. Um, you did the, the artwork, did you not? The piece uh, yes. of the, for the artwork? Um, mm -hmm. It was beautiful, um, it was very well done, so thank you for that. Um, I wanted to know what, um, how does art, um, art, how does it play a role in world peace and how can we use art to inform our children that peace is possible? Well, um, I think through teaching art, um, we can feel the culture and customs in our own country. And um, if we learn about the art from other countries, we can, let's say, um, understand the culture from other countries more and better. So that um, that is to say, um, there will be less misunderstanding um, between different countries. So um, I think by learning art and uh, let's say communicating in art, um, it is easier for us to understand each other and um, maybe lead to uh, likely um, communicating peace. And then, um, sorry about, I don't think about this. Yeah. Um, and then um, we're like, um, maybe staying, uh, staying grow up in uh, peace. And um, we're, <laughs> thanks. I can only think of these. Thanks it's okay, you're doing great, okay? You're Thank doing you. wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, uh, Mr. Colin, would you like to ask your question, sir? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, 
Um, I mean, I always love these pieces of pieces of art. I'm incredibly impressed. I, I also really love the 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 uh, the different cuffs that you had on the hands. Um, um, and, and I really love the connection of the flags and everything. So, but I was curious about, so you have the symbols of, of, um, uh, sort of crisis and peace, you know, showing that the, the past is in crisis with these, with wars and then the, the, the future, um, has this potential to be, um, peaceful. Um, but of course there are, there are wars going on right now. Um, and I, I think potential for wars in the future. So, so I guess my question is how, Maybe why, why are you optimistic for a future of peace and, and what can we do to prevent those future wars? Mm, well, let's see. <coughs> sorry. Uh, well, mm, so sorry about it, but could you please uh, say your first question again? Yeah, so why, why are you optimistic uh, why are you hopeful? I mean, I think optimistic about um, a future, a peaceful future. What gives you hope for that peaceful future? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I'd like to see a future full of peace because um, I think if we uh, um, we've got such a future, I think the children will grow up in peace and laughter. And you know, now um, uh, there are a lot of uh, sorry, uh, there are a lot of countries still during wars and their children, um, they're growing up in fear. So, um, and maybe in their hearts, they don't have a lot of dreams, but um, if the future is full of peace, I think the children will grow up happily and um, it's easier for them to, let's say, um, study and make friends with each other. And um, I think the human civilization will um, grow faster. Yeah. And for the second question. Uh, yeah, sorry, how, how do we prevent, how do we prevent, sorry, how do we prevent the future wars? Oh, thanks. Uh, so, um, I think um, to prevent wars from happening, the most important thing is still um, learning uh, because you know knowledge is kind of weapon. And um, if we use knowledge well, um, we can, let's say, um, so, sorry. Uh, if we learn more about other countries and learn more knowledge, um, the um, let's say all the countries around the world will maybe connect together and uh, being connect together and maybe uh, become a whole part and will solve all the problems uh, together. So um, I think from, um, sorry about it, um, to prevent future wars, we need to start from uh, like the um, teaching and starting from the works on uh, knowledge and teaching. And um, if the children, uh, if the children learn about uh, peace and maybe some science knowledge, I don't know, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, if they learn more about the things, I think they will have a sense to uh, solve all the problem together. Yeah, thanks, that's my answer. Thank you, Yufei. I think some of these questions the judges have um, a very good question. They're not easy to answer. And I think you did great and you tried your best. Okay, don't be nervous. You're doing great. Now, I would like to ask for our last finalist, finalist number 16. Um, Ms. Liu, would you like to go ahead and start, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. So. Hey guys, my name is Ze Yu Liu, and I'm so glad and, and grateful to be here this morning. I want to take a moment to thank all judges for taking up our submission work in the past few weeks. I appreciate all your effort. So 
Do you guys know the global GDP has reached to 84, uh, point, uh, 85.77 trillion American dollar in 2019 is a really astonishing figure. Such economic prosperity helped in alleviating poverty, generating employment, diversifying the market, and thus uh, reward people a sense of well-being. But do you know what's behind it? In other words, do you know what is the cost of a rapid growth in global business? I give you the answer to my presentation. In brief, world peace has to be guaranteed by environmental sustainability in the use of natural resources, while businesses are careful to minimize the impact of their behavior on nature, and the government law should be used to protect the environment. Nowadays, we hear the environmental pollution is getting worse and worse as a result of human activity. And I personally think some unethical business are to blame. In order to maximize their income, businesses tend to manufacture goods as much as possible before they do the marketing. The overproduction means the natural resources are being depleted extravagantly. Problems like overfishing, overfarming, soil erosion, deforestation become more and more common. This misconduct breaks the nice break the peaceful relationship between human and nature. If we maintain on the status quo, the resources will disappear in the near future. Thus, the fresh air, drinking water, arable land are unattainable for future generation. Once humans' living, living demands cannot be satisfied, chaos will arise among the countries. So from the business point of view, global enterprises has accountability to participate in environmental sustainability, since any of their decision making can easily raise discussion and thinking among the public. Therefore, give people a reflection about how the nature is being used as exhausting resources. Global company can assist with campaign like environmental conservation, investment in renewable energy, saving water, innovation in a sustainable construction and architecture, which are all promising solutions to solve the present situation. You know, the, uh, the sport company Nike runs an app which compares the environmental footprint of different fabric. So it is easier for a designer and consumer to make green choice. And of course, the sole effort of one business is not enough to safeguard the environment, but the collaborative effort should be paid. Uh, the global corporates can break the uh, traditional competition with brands uh, to each other to, for support in terms of the use of skilled resources. One great example are two big chocolate manufacturers, the Nestle and, Nar and Mars are working together to help farmers to meet the growing demand for cocoa. And uh, that is what I want uh, to express in my artwork, which is here. So in conclusion, with an ever increasing list of sustainability concern, it is a good time now for business to take a first step towards sustainable development goals. Since the ultimate peace between humanity and nature will pin hope on that. Thank you guys. Thank you to you for the wonderful uh, artwork. I think it was great. Now I would like to ask Mr. Vendriker, please remember to unmute your mic, sir, and then go ahead and ask your question. I need help. <laughs> oh, I, I, I really like the uh, fact that so many people produced uh, some art because I think art is, as has been said before, uh, it is one way of getting through to the heart of people rather than using words. Um, I do a little bit of art myself and I know that uh, just like when you write an essay, there's nothing on the page that wasn't intended to be there. Like there are, there are sometimes happy accidents if you're doing watercoloring, but still there's nothing there that wasn't intended to be there. So I'm going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to answer one, one of three questions perhaps or all of them, because I'm, I'm looking at your, your, your piece of art and I'm wondering, uh, I noticed the, the, the business, you have businessmen, no, no, no businesswomen there, I think. 
although it could, it could be, it could be that, you know, it's not necessarily, but they, but you do have their faces. There's, there are no faces. I noticed that the one person does not, uh, the hand is covered by the sleeve. And uh, there's one other thing, there's one other thing, oh, the, the dove is carrying a, a branch with, an olive branch with money in it. So you can, uh, I'd like to know, are all of those intentional or, and could you explain any one of them? Oh, uh, sure. So here's my artwork. So uh, I wanted to explain the uh, olive branch with the leaves, uh, with the symbol of the dollars. Uh, so the reason why I wanna to use this symbol is I think that, you know, the branch, the olive branch always symbol uh, symbolize the peace and uh, uh, like I wanted this symbol to give people a visual impact on how a healthy environment can ensure people's well-being as well as the future advancement because the environment which I symbol by the branch is the most basic foundation of our business development because our human are always like to take the uh, nature resources, natural resources as for granted. And I hope that uh, I, I hope that human can uh, uh, to give a reflection and how about how the environment is protecting us from the wicked world because only the a good environment can uh, ensure the uh, ensure the collaboration between countries and to support people for more human activity. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask you a lot of other questions too, but <laughs> I thought I thought the the hand uh, being covered by the sleeve was if that was intentional was interesting, showing a lack of generosity or a, a secret or a kind of a secret uh, desire. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, it's not a, it's not my intention. It's just uh, like it's just your package, your working package. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, George. Now may I ask Professor Wang to ask the final question. Well, good to be the finalist of the finalist here. Um, thanks, George, for um, asking the question. And I openly admit I'm myself are artistically challenged, therefore I don't even notice a lot of little details, but I do really appreciate um, what um, Zhe Yu, right, you're doing um, to um, use art to articulate a um, couple of things. And one is uh, to um, to um, to express uh, your concern about how business works and then how a business should all oh, they um, sort of uh, carry out their carry on their so-called uh, social responsibility or corporate social responsibility. And that's a really hot topic nowadays. So myself involved with a lot of NGOs to, uh, to work on that aspect. Um, but one challenge we often encounter nowadays is say how to how do we um, sort of uh, solve the conflict between the business benefit or business profit and the, how do they maximize their sort of a social responsibilities? So I'm wondering, so through your piece of art there, you're trying to present there. So what would you suggest, like as in the art, artistic form, say, how do we solve that conflict? Because it's really, really difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. because... I think business, the first priority of business is to making money. But, uh, but while during the process of the uh, economic growth, the problem of environmental pollution is actually impact our humans' normal life. Like we don't have the fresh, the really great fresh air as we passed as the past we have. 
So I think business first, they have to understand that the environment is the most basic foundation. They have to imagine that if we do not start with the environmental sustainable development right now, there's nothing for them to produce because there's no uh, there's no raw material for them to produce their product and they cannot get progress continuously. And also I think government should, should, be, uh, should have accountability to, uh, uh, to, to uh, actually educate this business and uh, to set down some and to enact some very stringent laws and to prevent this business from some unethical behavioral patterns Okay, so I think we're running out of time, right? So like George, I have a lot of questions, but I probably should uh, should be fair to every finalist here and um, just uh, stop there. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Zhe Yu, for your answer. I think all of us have a lot of questions, and it's definitely not a question that we can answer in five to ten minutes to be, you know, have a comprehensive answer. I think this these questions are up for discussion, and it will be a work in progress question as we all try to hope that uh, we hopefully will achieve world peace um, for hopefully soon. Thank you, Zhe Yu. I would like to congratulate all the 16 finalists for completing your presentation at the live final. I know it's not easy and thank you for sharing your time. Also, thank you to all the judges for sharing your time and your participation with TUIC. Before we go, I would like to introduce everyone to our youngest uh, contestant this year, which is 11 year old Thien Vo from Vietnam. Would you like to say hi Thien? Hello. And uh, actually, my name is pronounced Vo Thanh Tien. That's oh, I'm so name. sorry. <laughs> There's a it's okay. Form to pronounce. Vietnamese so names have weird orders. It's uh, totally okay. okay. Thank you for your understanding. Now, everyone, I'd like to direct your attention. I borrow a few minutes of your time to listen to our youngest contestant. As you can see, baby faced. <laughs> <laughs> he is our youngest contestant, 11, 11 years old, and he also did a wonderful job. And I would like to give him the opportunity to talk about his ideas as well. Take it away, please. So my essay was generally about leadership. I found the idea because I found it was particularly useful if you guys plan to work on a project and then you just scrap it, then it doesn't work. But and also, if you guys all work on a project and your teacher does not allow it, then also it doesn't work. And if you apply it to a bigger sense, which is the government, if the people are working on a project and the government does not allow it, the government will just not accept it and there will be no accomplishment. That will be very sad. So I talked about leadership and how leadership can improve world peace because good leaders make good war of peace. That was all I had about my essay. And uh, thank you to all the staff and judges and everyone participating here. Thank you, I really had a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Um, for this year, this year's GYC, the topic, as we know, is world peace. And last year was COVID-19. Um, this year, we had hundreds of entries and from over 20 different countries. And a lot of youth shared their idea, like the finalists here, as well as the youngest contestant mm -hmm. right here. And it is wonderful to have your participation. GYC is an organization that provides a platform for youth participation, youth discussion, uh, centralized um, centered in for a topic each year, and we will announce in a few minutes the proposed topic for next year. But before we do that, um, I would like to ask George to uh, talk about uh, his feelings and his um, ideas about world peace. Thank you. Well, I think uh, what we've seen now was a group of young people getting together and sharing sharing their ideas. And it just, it just shows how much uh, people communicating together and through various media, through uh, 
It can be through art, it can be through essays, it can be through speaking together. Uh, how big a difference that can, that can make. I really was touched, I don't want to emphasize this too much, but by the, um, by the works of art and, uh, and mostly actually, and I'm not gonna buy, and the, the judges have made the decision. So I can just tell you personally what uh, really the, the, uh, the uh, I forget the young man's name, but uh, the composer of the uh, song about love, I thought that that was very, very powerful. I thought uh, that young man has got things, he, he's thinking right. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that came that I, I noticed was that, you know, you know how when uh, people say, oh, you're all winners, but, you know, to make everybody feel good. Um, this competition is a real problem for us because I was doing, I was doing scoring and we were so, supposed to score out of 20. And so I was either scoring 19 or 18 or 20. And so I thought, how can we differentiate between all of these really excellent, excellent presentations? You were all really good, honestly. They were just terrific. And uh, none of us adults could have done better, believe me. So I just want to uh, congratulate all of you and to continue thinking right as the person who discussed moral education. There are right ways to think and there are wrong ways to think. And if we all continue to think right, I think the world will be a better place. Thank you. Thank you, George. Now may I ask Carol to continue the conversation with the judges, please. Okay, I have a question for the judges. Oh, I'm sorry, Daryl. Could you uh, unmute your mic, please? Okay, I want to thank all the judges, all the great contestants. Now, I have an interesting question because I've been studying world peace for a long time too, because my first degree was international development studies back in the 80s when the world was a different place under the Cold War. Now, here is an interesting question. Now, well, let's see, because we have different backgrounds here, and I thought of a different question, thought-provoking question. So. What do you think are the some formidable obstacles to world peace and how can we reduce or eliminate them? Now, I wanna get different answers from different judges because this topic has been discussed for a long time about world peace, sustainable development, all those kind of things. Daryl, who would you like to uh, direct uh, the question to? <laughs> no, this is to everybody. We'll start with the scientist first, Mr. Wong, and then we'll go around and uh, they can just go at verbatim. We'll start with the science for Professor Wang first. Well, thanks Daryl for pointing at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, there, well, I think that prop, I agree with some of the, you know, the, the um, presenters here today and they're all wonderful. I share that with George and I think they're it's just a wonderful to see uh, how young people um, talk about global peace from mm -hmm. different perspectives and then all, you know, either in the literature or art form. Um, so to me, um, what causes a problem nowadays is the greed, right? So it's so never enough. And I personally think that, you know, we have, we live in a wonderful world, we could, if people just stop being greedy, mm -hmm. and I think that will solve not all of them, but a lot of problems we have today. Okay, that, that's an interesting answer because Gandhi said that many years ago, there's enough in the world for every man's need, but not for every man's greed. So that's kind of interesting. You bring it back mm -hmm. to the, back to um, the peace activist Gandhi. Okay, somebody else wanna answer that question? George? Yeah, like we're in class, right? Everybody needs okay. to answer a question. <laughs> I do this in class all the time. I know you do. Well, all right. Okay, I'll, 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 give the, I'll give the big profound answer. I think the biggest threat to world peace is human nature. I think that's the biggest threat. And that there are parts of our human nature, and one of them, of course, is greed, that allow us to follow the wrong people to get involved in uh, mass uh, hysteria, 
or being motivated, where masses get motivated by one person to do the wrong thing. I just watched a video the other night, accidentally saw it, about uh, a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Oh, yes, I know him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer resisted uh, Nazism in the, in the 30s and uh, paid for it with his life. And uh, yes, he realized that uh, there were things about human nature that caused pe many people to do the wrong thing. They were not necessarily bad people, but we have to be very careful that uh, we do the, you know, we focus on the right thing and what is good and what is, what is right. Okay, great answer there. Yes, I've read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer too. Okay, we'll start with the younger panelist, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I echo <clears throat> what um, um, what Professor Wang and George have uh, have um, articulated. I will add um, another piece to that, though, of um, one of the biggest threats. I think is is um, individual and people's complacency that. Um, they feel that they can't be the change or can't help um, move world peace forward. And I think um, it's easy for us to look at it as a massive world problem and not something that we individually can solve. But um, I think if we look at what we can do personally um, to make that one step, then, um, you know, have that have that effect and have that um, ripple that ripple effect out. Um, so yeah, you know, again, what everybody else has said with the, um, with greed and, and all that. So, um, and then leadership. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a big issue, but I think, um, part of it as well as, is complacency. Okay, great. Professor Ruth, hey ho. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, be here and to share a little bit. I appreciated so much all the communication mm -hmm. that happened today. And I, I lived half my life in China ever since the Cultural Revolution of 1967. Oh. I saw a huge conflict. I saw the West and China absolutely shouting at each other. I was in Beijing in the embassy right after Tiananmen when the wow. governments were not speaking. I'm deeply concerned about the problems now between the Canadian and US governments and China. But I'm so thankful that as a scholar, I can still be in touch. I'm using VOOV, I'm doing lectures regularly with Chinese universities. So keeping open channels of communication mm -hmm. among students, among scholars, among artists, to me that has, I've seen over 54 years since I went to Hong Kong in 1967 through different crises, how communication kept the doors open and I'm confident that we will open up again between Canada and China and the US and China but it's not easy I know that but I loved all the speeches today but I thought communication is a very key one thank you so much for Great. giving that the chance answer. To share that. Uh, yeah, to last but not least call it what do you think are some formidable obstacles to world peace and how can we reduce or eliminate them well, I think one of the topics we didn't touch on as much today is the, is the, um, the obstacle that um, digital media platforms can present, mm -hmm. particularly with related to mis misinformation. I think, I mean, all you had to look at was the most recent uh, United States election to see um, how, um, you know, the use of social media platforms and other digital media sources can spread a lot of wrong information that can drive people to hate each other and, and drive people to work conspiracy theories. So, um, you know, I think there's, I know that in throughout countries throughout the world, there's a lot of legislation coming forward about how to um, legislate some of these companies to uh, reduce inf misinformation on their own platforms. And I think that's a very delicate um, balance to, you know, between freedom of expression and, 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 um, and pre preventing misinformation. So I think it's going to be a very <laughs> interesting, uh, you know, many years forward to see how this un unfolds. Okay, thank you. Interesting ideas there. Okay, so now we, we should be coming up with a finalist score pretty soon. They're still telling them up. We're we anxiously waiting. I just got 
little message via my earphone that we are actually ready to announce the winners. Would you Great. like to do so, please? Okay. So this Starting. is- Starting. Yes. Okay, yes, I will do it. Don't worry. Starting with first place winner in the World Peace SEM Presentation Contest, we have Jasmine Hugh. Congratulations, Jasmine. Thank you. Next, we have second place winner in the World Peace SEM Presentation Contest, Amy Zadu. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, this is mixed up. Oh, third. Third um, place. We, second place, uh, Daryl, we have I several. I already announced that. No, we have several uh, second place. Oh, sorry, have, sorry, yes. sorry, sorry. There's more than, there's more than, there's more than two, there's more than one second place winner. Sorry about that. This is like the Olympics, I guess. Sometimes there's more than one. Okay, another second place winner in the World Peace and Essay Presentation Contest, H Helena Zhu. Congratulations. We're airdropping applauses and hugs to everyone. Okay, we have another second place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest, Lisa Berra. Congratulations. Next, we have Michael Zhang, second place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest 2021. Congratulations, Michael Zhang. Another second place winner, Chelsea Muwatu. Congratulations, Chelsea. Next, we have third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest 2021, Leslie. Congratulations, Leslie. Next, we have Maner Nasir, third place winner, another third place winner, congratulations. Another third place winner, we have Iman Ali Said, congratulations. Another third place winner, we have Rex Zhu. Congratulations, Rex. Another third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest, Ziyu Liu. Congratulations. And another third place winner, Mr. Hu. Congratulations, Mr. Hu. And another third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest 2021, Yu Fei Zhao. Next, third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest, Barbara Rodriguez. Another third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest, Yi Hang Fan. Another third place winner in the World Peace Essay and Presentation Contest 2021, Yi Chu Long. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations, all of you. You did an excellent job. And before I close, I want to also want to thank all the volunteers. There were a lot of young volunteers helping with the World Peace Challenge. Youth okay. Challenge. Thank you, Daryl. There's a couple more things we'd like to share with everyone. First, I'd like to, on behalf of the organizing committee of the GYC, thank you to all the judges uh, and to our finalists and everyone who participated in this, this year's competition. Thank you for your participation, your time, <coughs> and sharing the information. As uh, uh, we know that uh, right now it is an unpredictable time, and we would like to ask you to stay safe. Uh, and like Professor Ruth said, uh, keep the communication channel open. I think it's human nature to do certain things. And one of them is to communicate with each other. Let's keep that channel open as well. Now we would like to take a look at the result for the most popular, uh, most popular finalist. Could, could my colleague share that result with everyone, please? 
All right, let's take a look. Oh, here we have it. Wow, it's very close. Just like a horse race, like I mentioned. Uh, the most popular is Maner Nasir, followed by Leslie and Lisa Berra. Helena, number four. Iman Ali Saeed, number five. And Amy, number six. And then there's a whole bunch tied for number seven. Jasmine Hu, Yi Hang Fan, Zi Yu Liu, Rex Zhu, and then following number eight, Chelsea Muwati, Yu Fei Zhao, Yi Shu Long, Michael Zhang. And honorable mention also goes out to Barbara Rodriguez and Mr. Wu. Great job, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your voting. Excellent. Congratulations, everyone. And now, I, I will. before we let all of you guys go, I'd like to introduce you to our proposed topic for next year. Let's take a look. Nancy? Oh, I think we might be experiencing a little like technical this. difficulties. I know it. Uh, Nancy, are you ready to share your screen? All right, Daryl, would you like to do the honors of announcing the proposed okay. topic? The Global Youth Challenge 2022 is artificial intelligence or AI, the future of humanity. So this is Sounds our great, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it's a wonderfully complex year's. topic next that I think topic. I think we could tackle. And this is a proposed topic. You can always go back to our website, theglobalyouth.org to check for more details. And I would like to thank everyone truly for your time and participation. May I ask for Ms. Jasmine Hu and Ms. Amy Zadel to uh, stay behind a little bit and also ask uh, Kelly, if I may, as well as Professor Ruth, to stay a couple more minutes, okay? Thank you everyone for your participation with air dropping hugs and congratulations. And we hope that next year we can um, do more of a face-to-face -face personal communication. Thank you everyone, you guys were truly great. And uh, as a teacher myself, I couldn't have done this in high school. So bravo everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Professor Ruth and Miss Kelly, would you stay behind as well as Jasmine and Amy, please? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Great job. Bye. Hi. Have a great bye. day, bye. slash afternoon, slash midnight, slash evening. Okay. <laughs> yes. You are such Excellent. a wonderful, Excellent. cute boy. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate being here. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Come and join us next year Excellent again, job. okay? Wonderful piece. Okay, thank see you, you everyone. Emmy. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, Lisa. Okay. Bye, Yufei. Bye, Jasmine. <clears throat> Congratulations. No, Jasmine needs to stay behind a little bit <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for, her, uh, for a couple more minutes. All right. So, Miss um, Kelly and Professor Ruth, uh, Phoenix TV, uh, we would like to get your thoughts on the competition, if we, uh, we may. And I will go ahead and ask him to come on, okay? Just a uh, couple more minutes, please. So only uh, drag means stay, right? No, me as well, please. We just need a talk. Um, you say you can go if you like. Thank you. Um, Anton, could you ask Amy to come back, please? Thank you. Who? Amy. Amy. Oh, okay, Amy. Where's she? Where's she? Oh, okay. That's a minute. Uh, Daryl, are you still there? Daryl, sorry, Professor and Kelly, just give us a few minutes. We're running up and down the stairs. Thank you.
All right, I'm back. But, uh, we still need a couple of minutes. Sorry, <laughs> it's a little difficult to do it the internet way. And uh, I would like to say thank you to Kelly and Ruth for uh, staying here and participating. It's wonderful to have your input. All right, Amy is back and Justin's yeah. waiting patiently. Thank you guys, just a few more minutes. And I'd like to congratulate you guys. You guys truly did a wonderful job. And I believe it's really difficult for the judges to narrow down hundreds to 16 and then to 16 to you guys. So congratulations as well. I apologize again for the wait. The, uh, uh, the interview and just, just set up the camera a little bit. Thank you for your patience. Thank you again. Uh, Christine, I just want to let you know, I have another meeting at 1230. Okay, so well, I'll make sure we get you out of here. <laughs> Hopefully in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Professor. I'll make sure that they hurry it up a little bit. Thank you. I wanted you to know that's all. Hi. So, Daryl, can you open the camera, please? Heard me. She can hear me. Like, you know, what's your name? What's your name? Hi, you guys are live. Everyone, everyone's live. So, please open the camera, please. Yes. Daryl needs to open the camera because the camera is not open on Daryl's front, okay? There we go. All right. I'm also recording from Zoom as well. I'm recording from Zoom, sir. Each of those recording. I'm recording from Zoom. Have All you, right. I want to make sure it's each recording. recording. This recording. Oh, it's a recording. Okay. Yes, sir. It is. Okay. Now, can you hear me, Professor? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you can you do the interview in Mandarin? Okay. We can. 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 Okay. We 用英文说两个问题，然后用英文，呃，用中文回答两个问题，好不好啊？好，Professor，你能不能坐高一点点？你的那个低了一点点，呃，等一下，对，好，我刚才。